I was probably making a thousand dollars a month and I was like I'm dropping out. I have to become more of a girl boss. I'm trying to launch my own brand. If you are a lifestyle creator and you talk about how much money you make or how you make money or things like that, I think it's taken as unrelatable. Whereas for guys, they can talk about it as much as they want and it's, and it's inspiring. As a girl, maybe you're expected to like chill more. Your mom, Ashley, has built a following of millions from sharing her life throughout New York City and relationships and style and friends. Today, she's going to walk through a new side of herself, your CEO, Ashley, and why she's been afraid to talk more about the business side of what she does. Three, two, one. Nice. That's the first time I've ever started a podcast with a high five. Oh, that's a good sign. Would you say high fives are a natural part and fist pumps a normal part yes. of your personality? I would say fist bumps specifically are. So yeah. not, I, I go nux. Nux. I say nux. Nux. Like you mm -hmm. actually say nux. I say nux. And then because I think a lot of times, especially guys, will try to dap me up and yeah. I literally can't. I literally wow. can't do a dap, so I have to say nux. Nux. And then I have to dom them with the nux by saying it first so they don't try to oh, dap so me like, up. Oh, so there's like theory to this. <laughs> but it's me trying to avo avoid an awkward uh, situation. I've definitely in the past, <laughs> usually when I see a guy, right, I'll be like, yo, my guy. Yeah. Slap. That's like cast. my worst fear. <laughs> Why? Okay, so say a guy does that to you. Why yeah. is that so bad? I think it's because there's so many ways to dap up a person. And I don't have the like DAP IQ of what way, like, cause you could do it and then they just like are like, yeah, or they do the hug or like, you know what I mean? Yeah, you're just like or they the do a cultural snap. context of being <laughs> guy. Oh, I really hope some guy would try to zap you up and you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't everybody. want it to go wrong. It's not the worst if it goes wrong, but if I can avoid it, I'll avoid it. <laughs> yeah, it's like so. all these like little social rituals where yeah. as a guy, I want, to be like, hey, I missed you and I love hanging out with you. Yeah. And I'm way too awkward to ever express any of this uh. in words. So we try and get as emphatic of a high five and hand slap as possible to the point. <laughs> Ashley, if we try this, yeah. like, let's try this right now. I have to use my right hand. Yeah. That that was good. I feel like it's really bad, though. <laughs> like, I, like, I just feel like there's like Kelly actually practices this with me so that I can try to be better at tapping people up because I'm, I do awkward hugs and I do awkward daps. That's my issue. I mean, I try my best. I don't think at the end of the day, it's like really like, I don't think about it that much, Okay. but you know, actually recently, this is really funny. I was um, at like a YouTube event with Colin and Samir and I went to go give Samir a hug. And I realized that I always go above on a hug, which is a little right. bit weird because I'm typically shorter, shorter than everyone You're else. Like but I go above to, um, I guess show them that I'm going in for a hug. Like I thought you were I'm gonna going say assert dominance. Yeah, I'm trying to dom them. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But I think I, by accident, I'm like being weird and like raised my arm up. And then Samir was like, he looks forward to the times he can go over so that so he's a taller person. And I just absolutely like took that from him. Yeah, he was so excited for the moment. So and you're like, I don't care. And, I was, and then I was like, bam. And so what ended up happening? Did both of you just clash or he went under? He went under. Sorry, Samir. <laughs> Oof, he's going to remember that. But then I redid the hug. And then see, and then it gets to the point where then you're talking about the hug and then it's awkward. Okay, and we've got to clip makes this and just text this to Samir and be like, this is what was going on. Yeah. So would you consider yourself typically an extroverted or introverted person when it comes to things like this? I have always considered myself an introvert, but I think, I think I'm actually an extrovert, but growing up, I had always been an introvert and I think I still internally like feel shy, but maybe I don't necessarily come off that way, if that makes sense. Yeah. But I don't know. I feel like I'm kind of shy. It depends. Like <laughs> when you said when you were younger, you were definitely more introverted. Yeah. Like growing up through like middle school, like yeah. were you the cool girl? Were you the shy artsy girl? Were you like, <gasps> The bro girl who's like, yeah, like I only do <laughs> fist bumps and I'm going to dom you and do it first. That's funny. No, I think um, I was really studious like in, in middle school, high school. So 
I focused a lot on school. I focused a lot on sports. I had all my time pretty much filled up and that's all that I really focused on. I would say, I don't know. I'm like, right. I feel like on the borderline between introverted or extroverted. I think a lot of people probably feel like that. Depends on the situation. It really does. Yeah. Depend on the situation. So when you look back to school, you said you studied a lot. You did a lot of sports. Yeah. Did you feel close? Did you feel you had a really strong network of friends when you were growing up? I think so. Growing up in middle school, especially, I had a pretty close knit group of girlfriends. It was probably like eight girls I want to say that was just like that was like a really solid that's a sisterhood yeah pretty much and then I think by high school slowly every year like more of us would find different friend groups so by the end the friend group had evolved a lot but yeah I feel like I'm still in touch with pretty much all of them in one way or another so yeah I remember you made your first video in 2018 it was showing off your thrift haul what grade were you in I think I was actually a freshman in college. Oh, so this is post high school. Yeah, this was post high school. But I did make some videos in high school. Or actually, it was more in middle school. And then I unlisted middle school, them. Middle school, your yeah. mom, Ashley, the yeah. deep cut. So I think I posted maybe 10 videos when I was 12 or 13. Wow. And they were very interesting. Okay, it was tell like, us more. Well, some of them are normal. Like some of them were like halls. Spring Hall, Hollister, like Abercrombie, like really basic hauls. But then other ones were like how to match your perfume to your outfit and wow. other things that just didn't make any sense. Wait, no, <laughs> I'm so curious. So I'll tell you, when I was growing up in school, yeah. like actually I was the biggest f-ing nerd. Like I was That's terrified. Funny. First of all, just of like humanity in general, but especially yeah. girls. And so I'm just like picturing 12 year old you is like, oh, like what perfume matches your outfit? Yep. And 12 year old me is like probably just like sitting there eating chicken tenders in the corner <laughs> next to a TV in a dark room. That's funny. And so what motivated you to make those initial videos? And I asked this because it's like a pretty big deal to make your first video. Yeah. Like it's a lot of work to be like, I'm going to put myself on camera for other people to watch. Yeah. I was super, super inspired by the beauty guru era of YouTube, Yeah, which I feel like the other girlies know this, but it was Bethany Moda, even like Michelle Fan, like yeah. a ton of like women and girls that were just killing it. And at certain points, I feel like they were like the highest like viewed and high subscriber oh, ranking yeah. on YouTube. They were which is leading crazy. on YouTube. Yeah. And that was just so fun for me. Like that era of like the neon colors and the halls and the room decoration and all of that was just super inspiring to the point where I was like, I really want to do that and like be a part of it. So I kind of dabbled in making my own videos. So you saw it. You're like, this is really cool. Yeah. What if I did this too? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And like when you're doing this as like a 12 year old, 13 year old, are you like, Today, your videos feature so many of your friends and family. Yeah. When you're doing this as like a 12 year old, are you going to like Amber or Andrew be like, hey, yeah. or was it more like, I'm going to try this out first and see what happens? At the time, it was just me. Yeah. So I think Amber, my sister, was in a couple of them here and there. I think I would try on outfits and then I would have her maybe do like a couple outfits if she wanted to. Or I did have some of my friends go in the videos, but I mean, there's only like a handful of videos. So it was right. really short lived. Um but today, definitely my family, my friends are a huge part of my YouTube videos. So it's a little different from when I first started, I think. You made a few videos when you were like 12 or 13 and then you stopped for a bit yeah. and then picked up in freshman year of college. Why stop? Why pause? I think it was because it was, or I wanted to have more of a focus obviously on my social life, school, all of that. And the videos were more of just a creative outlet. So I think I did it more like over summer. And then when school started again, I was like, eh. And also, um, I know my mom was really worried for me to be online as a young girl. Totally. Get weird comments from men or like show where I live, things like that. So I know that she was pretty apprehensive about it. And she was like, why don't you wait until you're a little older? See if you really mm. want to do it. Maybe it's like not a good time to do that right now. And so from there, I just kind of stopped, forgot about it. And then by the time I was in college, I was like, oh, maybe I should redo that. Yeah. The years in between, where did that creative energy go? I, throughout high school, did art classes. That was like my thing. So I feel like I wasn't super artsy outside of school, but like I always took their like advanced studio art option, always did that. So I was always painting or drawing and things like that. 
And I do really like drawing and painting. I haven't done it in a long time, but I feel like in elementary school, I was known as like the girl that could do the drawings. Oh, it's like, that was like me. She's like, yeah. you're, you know, there's always like popular girl, horse girl. You're like, she's really good at drawing. I'm, like, I'm good girl. at drawing. Yeah. So <laughs> when's the last I probably, like, time? Wasn't even. I kind of yeah. love, I wish we could like find your old drawings and like I know. look at them. I probably have some. If I can find them, I'll send them to you. Oh, them and then screen. everyone, we can decide. Yeah. The <laughs> power of the collective masses of the internet, yeah. judging a 12 year old be like, artistic drawings. No. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, this isn't realistic shading. Um, yeah. So like you said, shading. <laughs> it's like, this isn't my style. You haven't done it though for a while. What's the last time? When's the last yeah. time you like just drew and painted for fun? I would say over COVID. Wow. Is this like four, three years ago? Yeah. Over COVID, I did some paintings like of my bedroom and things like that. And I think. Actually, the painting I think is unfinished, but I tried. <laughs> I, I just yeah. think like right now my creative outlet is more like video. Mm. And so that's obviously where more of my focus is. And I think I'm a little spread thin sometimes where I don't feel like I have the time to paint, but I should really prioritize it more and make it yeah. a part of like something that I like decide I need to do rather than keep pushing it off. I asked that because... I, when I was growing up, did a lot of like origami. I got like pretty into it. Honestly, same. Yeah? Yeah. I remember sometimes getting to the point where I would be watching a YouTube tutorial and like get frustrated to the point of tears because I couldn't make like an origami baby Yoda or like something. You know what I mean? That is advanced. You were making I was Yoda to, out of yeah. there. I was like well, cranes I and frogs. Like I mean, I could do the crane and the frog, but I wanted to do the Master Yoda. To Master Yoda. And... I could never make him, so that Damn. was sad. Yeah, see, I feel yeah. what you described, that was me as well. I'd like yeah. watch these YouTube tutorials and be like, I want to make this. And then similarly to you, I mm -hmm. got distracted or rather shifted focus to other things in my life, which for me was like, oh, get into a good school. Yeah. And what's so funny is I stopped doing origami from like age like 15 to like, I don't know, like 27. And then when I was yeah. 27 years old, I quit my job and I was like, oh, I don't want to do it with my life. And a bunch of therapy and part of therapy mm -hmm. I was in this outpatient program. They have you go do art therapy. Oh, okay. So they put you in like an art classroom. It's like of the type you go to when you're like in second grade. That's fun though. Right. Like yeah. imagine going there as an adult. Yeah, you're yeah, kind yeah. Of like, That's kind of crazy because it's been so long for you to like be in a place like that. Yeah. And to be clear, it's just an art classroom. They don't tell you anything. Like you can do whatever. And Oh, okay. I was literally just sitting there. And for the first day, I was bored out of my mind. And the second day, I was like, oh, I guess like make a crane, whatever. <laughs> oh. And then I made yeah. it. I was like, oh, this is fun. And I got back into it. Mm -hmm. And then after I went and started Carrot, I haven't done a single one of those ever again. Oh, really? And they say, remind me, yeah. when you're like, you actually haven't painted it at all. It's funny. like to make more cranes. Yeah. yeah, it's like creativity. I still get expressed in other ways. Exactly. And I was thinking like, you mentioned you do a lot of it now in your videos. Mm -hmm. And like when you put out a video, how much of it is driven purely by that creative artistic side versus... Oh, shit. like through YouTube, I paid off my mom's mortgage. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think originally maybe it was more of a percentage of just like, oh, this is creative. This is fun yeah. now because it is my job. Of course, I have to take it a little more seriously, but I still think a huge aspect and the majority aspect of me making videos is like fueled by creativity. That's beautiful. So, yeah. That is precious to hold yeah. on to. Yeah. When you said you started to take it a little bit more seriously, what do you mean by that? Like what changes did you make mentally or in how you were doing your work? Yeah. I think the change is that once I realized I was graduating college yeah. and that this would be my job, it's kind of like, oh, well, I can't just be like, well, I'm like in college, like I'm figuring it out. It's like, no. You have to take this seriously because this is your career now. And if you don't make like ends meet, then it's like, how are you going to pay your rent? How are you going to continue on in life or make sure that your career is stable? And that's kind of where the pressure's on a little bit more there, but I still feel pretty relaxed. And then of course, as a yeah. YouTuber, there's always the question of what if YouTube like crashes or like TikTok takes over? Like there's just so many options of what could happen. I really highly doubt that anything would happen to YouTube because I feel like it is so solid of a platform. Mm -hmm. You never know. There's always like these questions that are just gonna be unanswered. It's like the 2 a.m. thoughts. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned like when you're graduating from school, you felt a little bit more like, oh, I should like figure this out. Now you've been doing it for a few years. Yeah. From outside perceptions of people who just look at your content, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. it seems to be working. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel like it's working yourself? I think so. Sometimes it's hard because I am a lifestyle vlogger to feel like I have enough 
content to put out almost because the content is so based on my day to day. Yeah. It kind of puts a bigger pressure on me having exciting life moments, which is a really interesting thing that I feel like I need to be either like moving or dyeing my hair or doing something yeah. exciting to have things to like document and to share with other people. But yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting to have that. Yeah, because like in a way, when you hear about your friends lives and you're like, oh, how have you been? Yeah. Well, you know, when you're close, you just often share feelings. But when sometimes you haven't seen them for a bit or you don't know them as well, often they're hitting the milestones like, yeah. oh, I just moved to a new job. I just went on a trip to Japan. Yeah. I moved apartments. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a new boy. Yeah. And it's almost like for you, it's like everyone's like, what's happening? Like, whoa. Yeah. What's the milestone? You mentioned to that, like, there's this sort of this pressure to like have an interesting life. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really, in yeah, it's a weird pressure to have almost, but that is for many people, at least in like my sphere of work, all of mm -hmm. us are battling to have an interesting life so that you have cool things to film, which is difficult in some way, but also it's a blessing because I get to go out of my way and I get to find mm. exciting things to do in order to videotape it. And I think because of that, just that fact alone has made my life more fun Ooh. and opened up more opportunities. So what's an example of something where maybe initially there was an element of like, this could be good content, but you went through it and actually you're like, this is just life meaningful. I mean, in some way, this is an example where my boyfriend Kelly was actually filming, but he brought us surprise skydiving. And in a way, it's like, sure, like it's for a video, it's for content. But I also think that's just like one of like the craziest memories like I've ever had in my life and was yeah. like life changing in a way because I'm like skydiving was just like so insane because I would have never imagined myself doing that. But to think now, like I've been skydiving, I moved to New York, like I did all these crazy wow. things. I feel like my prior self could never have even imagined that. It changed the story of yourself that you had in your head, like the type of person that you were. I think so. Yeah. I mean, when I was in college, even my first three years of college, I thought I was going to try to go to medical school. I thought I was always going to have a very professional yeah. career. I remember very you worked in life. ophthalmology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was an ophthalmic assistant for like three or four summers in a row, taking pictures of people's retinas and whatnot. Very fun. <laughs> but yeah, I always kind of imagined more of like a, a calm life, perhaps. And I feel like my life is just like the most absolute like chaos, like things going on all the time. But I love it surprisingly. So if you think about like who you are as a person. Yeah. It's funny. The most important thing, it's how you remember yourself and what you went through. Mm -hmm. Because other than that, like every night we go to bed, every day we wake up, our consciousness is like ending and resetting. Yeah. Like physically every three, four years, it's a little dark. Yeah. But the cells in our bodies entirely turn over and replace themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it's like this interesting question of like, when I think of myself, Eric, or you think of yourself, Ashley, it's like physically your body's changing every three, four years. Mm -hmm. Mentally, you're like literally turning yourself off and turning yourself on every morning. Yeah. It comes into like how you remember yourself based on the things you've done before. Yeah. And it sounds like three years in college, you were going to go into medicine, a very different, stable sort of life. Yeah. Then you ended up making a huge change. And now it's like beginning to catch up or like you're skydiving and <laughs> <laughs> something you might not have considered yeah, yourself yeah. ever doing before. It's really different. And I think maybe that's even why when you ask if I'm introverted or extroverted, when I reflect on myself, I think for so long I've kind of, I guess, labeled myself as introverted. And that's how like I've always felt but then if I actually look at like what I've done and how I interact with people I think I am extroverted but it's really interesting how like I think it takes a while for how I label myself to like evolve over time mm. as well do you watch your own videos I do yeah sometimes I'll go back and rewatch them um, I think a lot of times actually surprisingly old videos serve as good inspiration for future videos so sometimes huh. if I'm gonna travel or go somewhere new, I'll rewatch old travel vlogs, see what I did then, maybe like realize, oh, I did something fun there that I totally forgot about and kind of reintegrate it into new videos. And that's fascinating because when you're watching your old videos and you say you're getting inspiration, yeah, in a way that's not just inspiring new content, it's inspiring changes in your actual life. Yeah. <laughs>
ruminating and reflecting on your past experiences through your videos yeah. to figure out what it changed. It's like, imagine if everyone's lives or memories were just automatically recorded to be watched at any time. It's like people would probably get so much more awareness and learning, except yeah. you're doing this. Yeah, it is pretty cool to see even how I talk or my just how I act change over time on video as well and just have so many things documented is really it's a cool thing to see. Sometimes it's a little cringe for me, and that's okay. <laughs> what do you think but is, what have you found that's been cringe? Cringe. Well, actually, I don't like to say the word cringe because my one thing that I like to say is that I think we should remove the word cringe and we should not feel cringe. I'm like literally being uh, hypocritical right now, but I try, I try to say that the way to move forward in life is to not be afraid of being cringe. But I think at the same time, then you need to accept that you have been cringe and you will be be cringe in the future mm -hmm. as a creator. Like you, you're always gonna not like something about how you, how you were talking or maybe your tone of voice or how you acted. I think when I look at my really original videos, I can tell that I'm being someone that isn't truly me. I'm trying to be too extroverted to just try to be how I expect a YouTuber to be. And I'm like, why is she talking like that? Like, that's just not how I talk. And then I can see that. Like I can like physically see that in an old video and that kind of makes me cringe. But I think if I didn't push through that phase and be cringe, then I wouldn't have gotten to where I am today. If that it's makes like sense. The paradox of cringe. Yes. You can't rather the fear you have of embarrassing yourself. Hey, don't mm -hmm. let that stop you. And also know everything we do one day, we're probably going to look at and be like, I could have done that differently. Yeah, for sure. The fear of being cringe gets in the way of moving forward. When you so. look back at your life, do you are there moments where you felt you didn't do something you wanted to do because you were afraid or moments where you really were afraid but you did it anyways? Yeah, I think me even deciding that I really wanted to do YouTube, I of course was a little afraid of starting that, especially I think the scariest part is telling your friends or telling your family, hey, I have a YouTube channel and I want to create just because it opens up so much room for judgment and for people to say, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. And I think the scary thing for me was even if people said, I don't think that's a good idea for me to keep building and keep doing it regardless. I also do think, though, that when I decided to do YouTube, I wasn't necessarily scared. Maybe... I think I was I was pretty confident actually that this yeah. is something that I wanted to do. But it it of course though was such like a huge moment of change that of course it is like a little scary, you know. Yeah, I'm hearing you describe in some ways it's additional awareness of how people are going to think about you. Exactly. When you were in school, presumably mm -hmm. you were making videos, mm -hmm. but you didn't consider it to be like your thing. And in my head yeah. that my story is like, well, it's like more for fun. And so the stakes are lower mm -hmm. versus now everyone's going to be seeing me regularly and I'm going to have to keep doing this. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious when you look back, like you said, you've looked back at some of your own videos and you yeah. felt that level of cringe, right? Yeah. You're like a viewer <laughs> on yourself. Like what are some of those things you've seen where you're like, I would have done that differently now. I can tell in my videos from when I was younger, just talking louder, being a little more obnoxious than I need oh. to, trying to figure out my own personality on camera or maybe just seeing other YouTubers be like, hey guys, welcome to today's video, da -da 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 -da, talking really fast, really loud. And then me kind of trying to maybe mirror what I thought is supposed to make a YouTube video good. Mm. And then I think over time I realized, hey, you can be chill, you can be yourself, and people will still like the video, but there was a learning curve to me figuring mm. out how to just speak properly, I feel like, on YouTube. And I yeah, get that. That's, that's really the biggest thing. So about maybe like three, four years ago, I was in a YouTube video, my first YouTube video. Yeah. A creator was like, hey, I think what you're doing is really cool. Like, come fly out to Vegas, and I'd love to like bring you on camera and talk about what you're doing. Like, yeah. you're so natural, and we just like talk with each other. Yeah. And I'm like, sweet. And I'm sure you can imagine what happens. When you're in camera for the first time, suddenly it you, became like, like up. yeah, like a god <laughs> robot. And he's like, what happened? He's like, just talk to me like you were doing before. And I was like, ah, oh, but there's a camera. And then at the end, he was like, yeah, so like sometimes we don't always release these videos. Yeah. <laughs> it was never released. And oh, really? I just felt so bad. I was yeah. like, oh, my God, I wasted his time. And then 
a year ago, so this is, you know, much more mm-hmm. recent, I went on a podcast with Graham Stephan and Jack Selby. Yeah, I was going to ask if it was them, or was that the original one? No, the no? original oh, one different. was not them. It was another friend. Okay. But a year ago, yeah, I went on with Graham and Jack, and Jack is so thoughtful. He continued to give yeah. me feedback. He's like, dude, like, stop talking in bullet points. And for me, I was like, that's how I normally talk. I grew up very <laughs> awkward and shy. Yeah. Where I learned funny. to speak by, like, practicing public speaking. Like, I've been on first dates on the phone, Ashley, where they're like- On the phone? On the phone. Oh, I always do a phone, phone date first. Yeah, let's do what? a phone I've date. never heard of that. You just meet them? Well, actually, I've only been on dates with people that I've known through like a mutual friend. Wow. So I've never even had the chance. Okay, so I yeah. would always do phone dates. Okay. And the person- I said, that makes more sense because it's like safer. In yeah, because it's an online date. Like, I don't know if they're a crazy person. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like- <laughs> Like even, half fish even the or, men are scared. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I am totally scared. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think totally. Of course, as a woman, there's even more fear. But yeah. as a guy, I'm still like, okay, like yeah, who is yeah, this? Yeah. So I jump on the phone with them, and I've had multiple people tell me, like, you sound like you're interviewing me. And really? Like, That's just how I talk. Yeah. Well, so one, I totally get what you're saying, and you're saying it's all about like trying to be more natural and just being more exactly. comfortable being yeah. yourself. I'm super curious though. You mentioned that the people that you've met in your dating life, they were all in the real world. Yes. So you already knew them before. They already knew you. Mm -hmm. And see, to me, I don't think I've ever dated someone I've ever known in the real world first because I'm terrified. I'm like, oh my gosh, what if they, I like them and I, yeah. you know, oh no, we're just friends. Like, oh, that feels really bad. Like uh, for you, how have you grappled with the moment where you're like oh could there be something more like even with kelly like what was the moment when you were like this might be more than friends i mean i feel like since the first time we met obviously there's like there's just like something there i feel like intuitively you can pick up on it yeah Uh, for us we're discussing oh maybe we shall live together and then i'm like this is kind of crazy vibes because I could tell like maybe there's something between us and then it's like, do we talk or do we not talk because of like the roommate situation? And so that's when at that time we had to like talk to all the roommates and be like, hey, like, or I mostly like I to like the other roommates was like, hey, like, I feel like there's like this vibe between me and Kelly. I need to let you know before we decide to move in, because if it were to turn into something else or like even what if... What if this is like, at that point, like we're not dating or anything. I wouldn't even know if we would date, but I was like, what if we started talking and then we stop talking and then it's so awkward. That would be the worst situation. So we had to kind of go through all of those and decide, is it really worth it to talk or not? So that whole situation I think had a lot more sort of things weighing on it than maybe a typical relationship. But I think regardless, when you meet anyone in person, you do kind of have to decide hey, I like this person as a friend, like then you can really lose them as a friend if you already know them beforehand. So it's it's sketch for sure. So for you, you felt the chemistry. Even when you meet them, you can tell like, is there a vibe? There's not a vibe. Yeah. And in this case with Kelly, you like, you became your own HR department. Yeah, I had had to like, just because, I don't know, sometimes you have like that gut feeling and you know, and I was like- And you're like, nothing's even happened. You're like- I can't live with this man if I have a crush on him. Like (laughs) if something like weird happens, like it's going to be weird. So I had to like- we had to do an HR moment. Also, yeah. from the way you describe it, it sounds like if I understand this correctly, you were the one who was more like, we got to like talk about it and figure out from an HR perspective. I think both of us did separately, but we didn't together because both of us didn't want to admit to each other that we liked each other, if that makes yeah, sense. Could you imagine going to a meeting, your crush is there, and you're I like- I would literally be dead. I could never. <laughs> you're like, but so yeah. I may be interested in this man. Maybe yeah. not. I so don't know I if he's interested be in me. interested in this guy. And so we need to have a chat. Like, that would be so awkward. Oh, my gosh. But so that we both is, talk separately, yeah. I think, and then, like, figured it out from there. But it was weird times. It was an interesting situation to figure out. Even beyond just your relationship with Kelly, just, yeah. again, as a creator, your friendships, even your platonic relationships in there. Yeah. When you became a creator, would you say your friends, I imagine they're probably more from the creator world now, right? Now they are. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Almost all of them. <laughs> yeah. You're like thinking about it. Like, yeah, like yeah. pretty much the majority. Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah. And I'm curious, when you look at your friends now, what do you feel like are the things that draw you together? Like, what do you feel like when you meet someone, you're like, this is someone I want to get to know better? I think what's really cool about people in the creator world is that 
everyone is really driven and really motivated. And I think mm. that's the thing that kind of interests me the most is that in this space, I feel like it's a lot of like-minded people in the sense that we're all like go-getters, we're all excited. Um, I think in a way we're all on the front of something new because it's such a new era and there's so many changes. Mm. I feel like it's a gold rush in a way of like the creative or like of like the internet almost, if that makes yeah, sense. It's early. Yeah, it's, it's pretty early. So it's kind of cool to go through that with other people and bond over ideas or just even the hardships of being a creator. But with that being said, I do still have like a good amount of college yeah. friends and stuff. But I think, um, yeah, the, the creative field is, is different in a way where people are really open minded as well. Many of my friends are now creators and founders Yeah, because, for example, you could have just gone into medicine mm -hmm. and you would have had a relatively secure and like you wouldn't have ended up on the streets, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you would have been okay. Yeah. <laughs> and in a way to choose YouTube, you actually have to like really choose it deliberately. Yeah. It's a risk. It's like a, yeah. it's a gamble. Over what yeah. could have been. And I think everyone, because it's still so early, mm -hmm. because it's harder, that's precisely what selects for people who are similar in some ways, because it's people, all of us were just like, you know what? Like, I actually really do want this. Something in this really fulfills me. And exactly. even though it is risky and certain, I'm going to vibe with it. People are passionate. And that's yeah. what's the coolest thing to see is that people are passionate enough to give up usually a stable income or a stable yeah. job path for something like this. I remember Kelly told me that when he was thinking of this decision that he would like argue with his mom crying over like, I'm not going to do soccer. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> like a big <laughs> deal. This. Yeah. When you were going through your process, like, Hey mom and dad. So I'm not going to be a yeah. doctor. I'm not going to work in medicine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go be YouTuber. What was that reaction? What was that relationship like? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it was definitely hard for them. I am their oldest daughter always, you know, I think it's hard for them to see me be someone that like, I'm just consistently getting those straight A's working so hard to like, oh, make so sure like I'm golden like golden child. Oh, I was like, I was like, I mean, I think I naturally, like, I love school. I love learning. But, like, I was a tryhard for sure. Ooh, oh, yeah. Good grades. But I think that's sports. I think that's just my, I think that's my personality type is I'm, like, yeah. I love to do things and I love to, like, I think, like, even, like, test taking. Like, I love test taking because I feel like I'll study hard for it. And then when you know the answers and you take the test, it's, like, satisfying. So you crush way. it. So you, get, you know, you can crush it. But then there's also, you know, if you don't study enough, then it's a pretty bad feeling, <laughs> yeah. whatever. But um, I think it was hard for my mom to see me have so much potential with that and then decide yeah. to do something in a career path that she's completely unfamiliar with. Both my parents are optometrists. Oh, that's so also potentially that's your huge, interest in medicine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a huge reason why I was kind of pushed into the medical field is because yeah. they both went to optometry school. They're like, hey, if you want to do something down that route or the medical route, like, a lot of my other family members are dentists. My aunt's like a cardiologist. So just I feel like people in our life are all like, well, this is a good route and we can all help you. And we all know like how to go from point A to point B. And also it's a very credible way to like, I feel like my mom yeah. always maybe looked forward to having a daughter that was like, here's my daughter, like Ashley Alexander, MD. Like, you know what I mean? Like Dr. that type of thing. Like Ashley for sure. Alexander. Yeah. So I think any parent could be like, oh, that'd be cool. Like for sure. If their kid was like that, but at first, my mom was pretty hesitant just because I think yeah. people that are just older than us have never seen our jobs ever. Like, our yeah. jobs just didn't exist Like, this for is them. wacky. Yeah, like, this is, like, weird. This is some weird stuff for them. So my mom was like, can that be a job? Like, she just even doesn't even, like, didn't even know that it could be a job. Both her and my dad were like, okay, like, you can try it. But, like, that's what, that, which is why I did end up still graduating college, I low-key, there was a point when I really wanted to drop out. And I remember being like, mom, I don't want to go to school. I was like pretty decent. And honestly, I was not good enough on YouTube to drop out. I was probably making a thousand dollars a month. Okay. Which is like 12 K, which is minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm dropping out. <laughs> I'm like, this is my job. I want to drop out so bad just because I really loved YouTube. And I felt like it was my calling. And I felt like school was taking away from it because I'm like why am I sitting in like 
physics too right now if I want to do YouTube and yeah, that was a whole thing. And wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad I didn't because I think I learned that I actually still love school, but I eventually switched to business. So I had a little more time to sort of just focus on even learning things that could be applicable in my future. Business majors catching strays but right now. But I know. I'm okay. so sorry, business. I mean, honestly, I'm a business major. I feel you. It was hard, but it wasn't as hard as chem and physics. Like, I got to be for my real. With my bundles of free I know. time. <laughs> with my... <laughs> with my hours of free time, just kidding. But no, I, my business school was still kind of, it was like, or my school is so STEM based. Cause I yeah, went to RPI. Yeah. It yeah. was a polytechnic Institute that I thought I was going to go into business school. I was going to major in marketing. I thought I was going to coast. No, it was all data analytics. I'm literally in there, like in Excel, like doing so much math. And my goal was to not do math, but it's okay. It kind of backfired, but I still graduated business degree. Yeah. Um, it was a lot at first. Definitely caused a little bit of family tension. I think every YouTuber I've ever talked to is like, yeah, my parents were nervous about right. it. Because like you, they, they're looking out for their kids. But I think post-grad, like by the time I graduated, my parents were so proud of me because I was able wow. to graduate debt-free. And it, I lifted a huge load off of their shoulders because they they for my first like I think year of school or second year of school were trying to help me pay my tuition but I was still taking out student loans things yeah. like that I was going to graduate with student loans that I would have to pay off for years and years and years to come like I remember my parents paid off their student loans like I was alive and my brain was still thinking enough that I was like oh my parents just paid off their student like, loans you know what I mean like I'm conscious paying this off. yeah so my parents were really proud of me that and this was through YouTube earnings yeah through YouTube so they were super, super proud. I feel like they're my biggest supporters to this day. They'll play my videos. This is probably giving me like a fraction of a cent every time, but they'll just leave their phone open and play my videos just to help me make a little AdSense. That is like an act of service. Yeah. They're just like, oh, every screen of this house is going to be playing Ashley's videos no, on loop. Sometimes it's like I come home and I'm editing or like I, I want to get away from the sound of my own voice and I come home and I, I hear it in the distance and just I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, it's just on loop. But I, I know Kelly's parents do the same exact yeah. thing. So it's a it's a proud parent thing. for oh, sure. Oh, my mom watches my podcast also. Oh, that's so yeah, cute. Which is funny because I talk about her a lot. And yeah. I just saw her recently because I'm in New York and she's in New Jersey. I hadn't oh, seen okay. her though before that for three, four years. And I felt oh, really wow. sad about it. But she messaged me things like, it's OK. I still see you in your videos. Oh, that's so sweet. I was like, oh. That's so I cute. I have to visit her now. Yeah. And you're from the East Coast originally, I'm originally right? from, from the Jer East Coast. Okay. Yeah, my parents also Asian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> I know your, your mom's Asian. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's why I was like so curious. And I really love to like they have it sounds like totally come around to it. Like in Absolutely. the beginning, like what is this? Yeah, I think once they learned and were able to see me kind of flourish and I think be happier and more passionate, they totally came around. So, so what changed? Because like you were squarely on this medicine track and yeah. then you wanted to drop it's out like, at a 12K minimum salary to start <laughs> going new videos. Like, I was making bank. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm I just mean, kidding. You were making something. <laughs> I was making something. It yeah. wasn't enough to be like, oh, this is a no brainer. No. And you're going from this person who you grew up, as you said, like relatively shy, yeah. not making videos to like, I'm dropping out of school. Like what, yeah. what was it about this early videos? What was going on there? Yeah, I think I came to the realization that my choices that I was making had actual real life I'm forgetting the word but like consequences I realized hey I'm going to school for medicine it seems so far away and then I, I slowly realized if I'm doing this I really have to be a doctor I really have to do this as my wow. job for the rest of my life and I decided or I I had a deep like thinking moment with myself and I realized hey I I really feel like I'm more of a creative person. That's where, that's who I am more deeply inside. That's what I would enjoy doing more with my life. Yeah. And so that's why in college I decided, hey, I'm going to do YouTube. I'm still going to do college at the same time, but I'm going to try YouTube and see if I can get it to the point where I could change the route of my career path potentially. Yeah. Again, you're like reassessing your story yeah. and who you are. And I love that point too, where I think for me growing up, I always believed that it might suck while you're going through it but like once you yeah. hit it it's worth it and it's going to be better that's mm -hmm. why 
I was in a similar situation to you where I wanted yeah. to do more creative things. And then I stayed the path on the corporate yeah, route. Yeah. I worked in investment banking, management consulting, and tech for like six years, six, seven Good experience, years. experience though, yeah. Sure, I'm happy I did <laughs> it. But, you know, it was a different vibe, right? Yeah, yeah. And I remember for me, like, the main consideration was this is not great but eventually it will get better. And then I realized it doesn't. Whenever you hit the milestone, the promotion, the salary jump, it's just more of the same, right? There's mm -hmm. a saying that like, life is like a pie eating contest where the reward is more pie. Yeah. So if you don't like the pie eating itself, you shouldn't stick with it. I'm hearing exactly. you describe like, oh cool, like I'm studying, like I am eventually going to be like a doctor. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. It feels so distant even when you're in high school to think, oh, I'm doing all this work for college or for yeah. my job eventually. It kind of just feels like you're, you're working at something and you know it's for good reason, but you don't actually come to terms with the fact that, hey, if, if you keep doing this, you're actually gonna have a job like yeah. this or that, yeah. That's insane though. You're like, I am ready to drop out. And yeah, well, I was yeah. also delusional, I think. But, uh, <laughs> but I think sometimes as, I believe the statement is sometimes Delulu is the true Lulu and the Salulu. And that's, and that's fact, factulu. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. No, that's good. Thank Boom. you. <laughs> I love how I don't. I can't tell if I was going for the bump first or you were, but we didn't. And then it was just it was just mutual vibes were good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I actually do think you have to be like a little delusional in the sense that you have to be able exactly. to believe in yourself before the metrics show it out. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I I remember when I first started YouTube, um, just being like, I'm gonna have 300k by the end of this year. Like, just I'm gonna do that. And I didn't, but I think I got to 70K yeah. and that's still way more progress than I would have made regardless. And you just have to believe in yourself a little bit irrationally and maybe you won't do as much as you say you will, mm. but you'll get yourself in the right direction. And when you started to make content, I remember Kelly told me there's a period where he was living in LA with Luke mm -hmm. and he couldn't think of video ideas. Yeah. And he told me he made a video about making sand sandwiches oh i've actually seen that one i've been blessed enough to see it it's actually unlisted i don't know if he would show you but you, or maybe it's private even but you cannot find it online but yeah he ate a sandwich just full of sand like went in there pff, ate it like, so gross he just could not think of anything <laughs> to do for content well, you can think of anything better it's like i'm in la like there's a beach <laughs> there's, there's bread there's sand like yeah. i have bread like <laughs> This I'll is make terrible. A sand sandwich. And he referred to this like as a moment, like the sand sandwich moment. That's just like he like, hit rock bottom. <laughs> yeah, that was his moment. He's just like, what am I doing? That's like, so funny. what is this content? I'm so curious for yourself. Like, your content has also grown and evolved. Yeah. Right? Like, for example, as you said, it features your friends and family mm -hmm. much, much, much more. I'm curious, have you had sand sandwich like moments sand sandwich where you were just moment. like, I don't like this content, I need to change? Or was it just like, no, it was actually more of a happy path, this sort of natural yeah. growth and progression? I don't think I've been as down bad as the sand sandwich, I'm not going to lie. But I do remember after graduating, it was a really hard adjustment for me because mm. at that point, I remember the same April that I graduated, I also hit a million subscribers, which was really, really cool. But at the same time, I almost sort of was like, oh, that these two milestones I've been trying so hard to hit are now gone. Like, what do I work for after oh. this? And it really set me into like a lull almost after I graduated that whole summer. I feel like I was posting inconsistently. It was just a hard, even transitional time in my life because I was now out of school. I didn't mm -hmm. have that set schedule. I was living by myself in a new apartment. And I was just like, what am I doing? I feel like I don't have, I also felt like I didn't have any video ideas, which I guess is the worst for people like Kelly and I. Because both of you are worst. vloggers. Yeah. So I was just like, damn, I really don't have anything to like vlog about. It was really hard for me to come up with ideas. And I was lucky enough that that same summer where I was kind of in a funk, that's when I met Kelly. That's when I met just more people in the YouTube space yeah. in New York City and then eventually decided to move there. And that was the biggest thing that wow. I think honestly like changed my life. Yeah. That was your sand sandwich moment graduating. Ironically, yeah. achieving your milestones, getting both the degree yeah. and the million subs. <laughs> and then it's always like the emptiness that comes right after. You're just like, exactly. I worked so hard for this. Yeah. <laughs> cool like and you're like okay okay like yeah. guess i'll go to bed now and like 
wake up. And then, yeah, I've always felt like people is always like every single big change I've made in my life has been because I ended up spending time around the people who I wanted to be more like. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And they, they inspired me to make change. I'm curious. So like for yourself now, what are you most excited about potentially doing or feeling? What are you most worried or anxious about? Hmm. So both excited and anxious, yeah. the two. Yeah. They could be separate yeah, vibes yeah, yeah. or they could be the same thing doing both. Oh, I guess you're right. Hmm. For me right now, very behind the scenes, I am in another transitional period, I feel like, where I have to become more of a girl boss. I'm trying to launch my own brand, taking on like employees, dealing with lawyers and stuff. Wow. So I feel like I really haven't talked much about it publicly. Your but CEO, Ashley. That's me. But it's been a lot. And I'm sure you're like great at it. That's probably your forte. But for me, I'm kind of like... It's hard. It's a little difficult for me to be like a boss because I'm not yeah. used to telling people what to do. I usually I do my own thing and then I post it and like leave it alone. But to work with a team of people and potentially have like people working around me or for me, I don't like I feel like I'm not even comfortable saying the phrase that like people work for me because I'm like really like people work. <sighs> it's like a weird thing for me to like come to terms with, I think. But I'm working on a matcha brand. So hopefully that will be launching wow. next year. Fingers crossed. But We'll see. I totally understand. You mentioned like, oh, that might be your forte. No, actually, it's not my forte. Wait, really? I feel like it would be. Oh, no. It's so weird in a capitalist society to scale and get bigger. The price of being good at what you do is you don't get to do it anymore. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> like, oh, now you need to find other people who can do the things that you yourself did. And now your yeah. role shifts more to like guiding managing. and managing them, which is so different yeah. to find that balance between like oh you're need to do with this exactly <laughs> like i'm telling you versus like i need to be able to like hire fantastic people who i can trust yeah. and like vacillating between one vibe and the other it's really different and i'm not used to managing people and now i feel like i spend a lot of my time managing things versus yeah. i used to just be like clicking buttons on my computer now you have to learn how to teach people things, how to find people to work in your team. Or like for my matcha brand, for example, now I'm trying to be like, oh, I need to like hire a graphic designer or hire like a creative director, or yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Trying to figure out things like that just because I know as much as I would love to do the doodles myself on Procreate, like I am not like a package designer. That's not like my specialty. You know what I mean? Right. So it's interesting to have to find new people, have to guide people in general it's just it's just so different i went through a startup leadership program like a year or two ago yeah and it was basically like adult summer camp where yeah. everyone who's like now managing and a founder and creator just like came around and we just like talked about our feelings it was actually yeah. really nice and oh, good. they talked about like what is leadership like why do people follow you because i also actually felt a lot of discomfort over this concept of being like your manager you're like being bossy you're telling someone what to yeah, do like, i feel bad which is <sighs> but you like have to do it and it's really interesting and then also like giving feedback if something's not the way you like it yeah i'm really bad at that too i need to be better but i i I'm a little bit of like a people pleaser. Me too. Yeah. And then it's just so hard to make, to like make someone feel bad. <sighs> like I feel so bad, but I, as a leader, you got to man up. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's, also, it's a like, learning experience. You care about the quality of your matcha. Yeah, so, exactly. Very same vibe. So I always felt so much discomfort over the concept of managing people. So I would always be like, oh, so like, hey, like if you want to do it this way, like that'd be cool. Yeah. But like if you don't, like that's fine also. Yeah. And then like say they wouldn't do it that way. I look at it and be like, oh, so like this isn't really what I had in mind. If yeah. like you could do it like this way, like that would be cool too. Yeah. And I think at a certain point, I'm just like, what am I doing? Because, it's like worse and worse. Like Right. Yeah. Or Because I remember like people just be like, can you just like tell me what you actually like what? what? <laughs> like this is very, very hard. And there's a couple of things I learned from that camp. One of them, there's a saying, they said, with alignment comes agency. Mm. And the saying was, the more you align with someone on both, do you have the same knowledge base? Do you have the same principles of sifting through that knowledge and figuring out what to do? Yeah. If you have that alignment, great, they have agency. They can do things with their own freedom that you don't need to watch over. Mm. And so then it's like, okay, my goal should be less like, do it precisely this way and more making sure do we know the same bits of information and are we thinking the same way? Yeah. Except those two things are actually really, really hard to get because practically speaking, 
your team is not going to know everything you know, and they're yeah. probably not going to be thinking the same ways that you are. Yeah. But the closer you can get them to it, the more aligned they are. Yeah, getting on the same <sighs> wavelength in general is like... Yeah. It's almost an impossible thing to do, but I feel like you can get pretty close. It just takes a lot of... What do you feel like are your best cases where you look back at like your CEO, Ashley, and you're like, yeah, I actually did a pretty good job here aligning and helping people understand what page I was on. I mean, I think about more recently, I've just had to do a lot of contract work and I was like, you know what? I got to be firm. This is something Mm -hmm. where when you negotiate, I can't just be like, oh, it's like, okay. Like it's something that pertains to like my whole life. I'm not going to sign a long long contract and like have it not be terms that I really like so you know I have to go in and be like this is what I want this is the amount of years that we're gonna work together yada 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 and for me like internally I'm like I'm so scared right now (laughs) but like externally I just have to be like that's how it is I feel the same thing I've thought a lot about this because I want to be a better leader and I'm like for me I think those people pleasing tendencies come from a place I'm also scared yeah because I think I grew up or internalized expectations that, hey, if I get things wrong, like people are mad at me and bad things happen. (laughs) So like try and get it right. Mm -hmm. And like weirdly, the best way to navigate a situation like that is to, you know, try and do your best to make people happy. Except as a manager and leader, you have to weirdly sometimes direct people to do things where they like might not necessarily be super happy or at least Mm -hmm. tell them like, I don't agree with what you're doing. Yeah. Even though that sort of has to go overcome the, no, don't be mad at me. Yeah. I think sometimes you just need to be firm and just like push the people pleasing aside, which is hard. But in certain circumstances, I think I'm getting better at doing it and just being like, hey, what what I think is, hey, this is normal for people working in these fields. They're totally used to getting that criticism, totally used to getting pushed back on certain things. And then I just have to be like, okay. I'm in a new space. Maybe I'm new to it, so I'm uncomfortable, but like it should be fine. (laughs) Have you ever let people go? Let people go. Mm, I feel like in a sense, yes, there's people that I've worked with that I was just like, maybe this isn't the best fit. Yeah. Um, For example, uh, I feel like I've worked occasionally with people that will like do like graphics for YouTube videos and usually always... I choose a girly that watches my videos and knows my kind of aesthetic and my vibe. vibe. And then one time I was like, I'm going to choose a boy and see if they can do it. And it just like, it came out a little more manly and not the way that I was envisioning. And not to, now I'm like literally having like a gender bias, which is so messed up right now. And I do have boy, like boy editors and people that are like totally good. But this is for the aesthetics of your channel, which should be aligned with you and your vibe. Yeah. One time I had too manly of a man try to edit Wait, like graphic. what was the graphic look like? Was it like your mom, Ashley, mm. Y-O-U-R? It wasn't like necessarily <laughs> Your graphics. mother, yeah. Ashley. <laughs> it was like, I'm like fading something in a video and instead of maybe it's like a cute like circle, like boop, it was like a crossfade that's like, and I was just like, I'm so sorry, man, but I can't deal with this. I love your sounds. Yeah. You're, like, you're like, I need a little more like, like boop, 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 not like, vzz. yeah. So obviously a huge issue, guys. No, seriously. You understand? Because, no, <laughs> yeah. like we joke about it, but like literally your brand is yeah. tied to your content and it's yeah. tied to why people watch you. And mm-hmm. that's like the hard thing when you're trying to scale is how do you stay true to your own voice? It's not like what's right or wrong. It's yeah. about what's true to your brand because that's For why sure. people watch you. Yeah, exactly. I have had similar sometimes we post things and I'm like this this is not this is not the vibe and yeah. it's like your part of me is like oh do I get to tell them and part of me is like yes because this is not my vibe mm-hmm. this is how I think the brand should be exactly I'm um the the other thing that I learned from that summer camp was is they said it's like it's like why do people listen to you right mm-hmm. and there's really like three different types of motivations the first is like power based which is because you are paying them yeah <laughs> and like duh <laughs> But in an ideal world, it's not just that because that's mm-hmm. in some ways the least thoughtful and valuable reason why someone wants to work with you. Yeah. And the second, it's it's informational. They listen to you because you know more than they do. Where it's like, hey, you should do it this mm-hmm. way because like here's context about how to do it where you might not have thought about this or I know it will play better this way. And the third, it's around the concept of 
you are someone they want to be more like because they admire you. Yeah. That's the third reason why someone, why I would listen to what someone's telling me to yeah. do, right? It's either like they are paying me and they're my yeah. boss. We're like, okay, they like know things I like, did and I didn't think of this. Or it's yeah. like, oh, I actually like admire how they think and what they do. And like, yeah. well, yeah, I want to be more like that myself. Mm -hmm. And I thought a lot about that because I think so much of my discomfort when I started off as a manager was like, oh, like I'm paying you. This feels weird. Like, I'm not sure why. I deserve this money more than you do. Like, yeah. why am I the one paying you instead of you're the one paying me? Like, yeah. <laughs> with a roll of the dice, it could have easily been that other way. So this yeah. feels really uncomfortable to mm -hmm. me. The informational piece was always more natural. I was like, yes, there are things I know that you don't. But then when I learned that from it, I was like, oh, you know what? I should try and be a leader that other people admire and look up to. Yeah. To be clear, I don't think I'm there. And <laughs> so many... Oh yeah, like my team, Getting they there. openly give me feedback. They're like, "Yeah, do this." I could. I'm, like, I'm sorry, but like, oh, it's a, good, it's something I aspire more toward. Like, that's mm -hmm. how you build a team. It's like if they admire how you do business, it's like, okay, they want to be more like you. Yeah. I'm so curious for yourself. Yeah. You mentioned you haven't talked as much about your your CEO Ashley in your yes. content. Why is that? You're a vlogger. It is part of your life. Um, I think because I like to some extent to keep it on lock. I just because I also think I haven't announced really necessarily like the name of the brand or things like yeah. that. It's more of a thing that's just behind the scenes and I don't want to get ahead of myself and like preemptively say something and then I like I don't end up like launching for you like a long time. You want to be thoughtful. Time. Yeah, I want to be thoughtful about it. Um but at the same time, I think it is interesting how differently talking about business or finances yeah. or things like that is taken. Um, if you're a female creator, unless you're specifically in the tech space, I feel like if you are a lifestyle creator and you talk about how much money you make or how you make money or things like that, I think it's taken as unrelatable. Whereas for guys, they can talk about it as much as they want and it's, and it's inspiring and it's cool wow, and it makes yeah. people want to be like them. But when you're a girl, it's like, be humble. Why would you even talk about that? So it's like these yeah unfairly different expectations and receptions to what you talk about and how yeah. people think about it yeah so a good reason why i don't talk about it is because i feel like it's might not be received well if i'm being like if i'm being for real that's that's really why for example when you share things like yeah you paid your college education your debt off you paid for yeah. a mortgage you helped your siblings because of the money you made yeah i'm like oh i'm a ceo i'm running a company i'm launching a modern brand i have yeah. employees versus let me talk to you about my life and who I spend my time with. Yeah. I'm hearing people treat it really differently. They do. Yeah. So even when like I talk about like, oh, I paid off my college debt. I'm like, I'm like weirdly really nervous saying that because I feel like it sounds unrelatable. And I, I do feel like almost bad in a way because I feel like I, I'm, it's such like a privileged standpoint to be a YouTuber and to be able sure. to do that. And I'm obviously so, so grateful to be able to do those things, but I think at the same time it can be received differently um, than maybe it would be if I was like a dude just like, this is so cool, I do YouTube, I yeah. have all this money, I bought a Lambo and now I'm here and then everyone's like, yeah, like let's go. I think as a girl, maybe you're expected to like chill more and just not really like, get into the nitty gritty of it. I do think for a lot of my viewers, it would be really interesting to hear yeah. that side. And so sometimes I think it would be cool to talk about it, but I, I really hesitate doing so. When you share things like this and yeah. people don't receive it in that same way, like how do you feel? How do you handle that? I don't really know if I'm going to be honest. I feel like I haven't really actually spoken about it enough to get too much negative feedback personally, but I've seen it happen to other people. And so maybe that's where I'm trying to avoid it a little more. Um, but I think for me, I have pretty thick skin. So regardless, I'm like, hey, like I shared what I want to share. If you're upset about it, I'm going to try not to like get myself upset about it as well. But I want to make sure like when I do talk about things, it's like in a tasteful way or I do have to have a little bit more yeah. of like a PR management in my own head, like when I'm talking about this. It stuff. is crazy, though, that the fact that you were successful, for example, as you said, when a guy talks about how much money they've made. Yeah. 
people don't have the same concerns over like, oh, he's not relatable anymore. He's lost his roots. He's not yeah. one of us. They're like, oh yeah, like I want to be that guy. In fact, yeah. there are a lot of people who will excuse personal failings and mistakes from someone if they're like, mm. oh, that person is successful and makes money. Uh -huh. And it feels so unfair when you're like, well, as a woman, when you talk through this, you run the risk of people literally being like, oh, I don't like her anymore. Yeah. It's like you, you were better when you didn't talk about this type of stuff. We recently did a podcast with an entrepreneur named Layla Hormozy. Mm -hmm. And she's CEO of a portfolio of businesses that make over $200 million in revenue. Oh, my God. Her story, she used to be a personal trainer at a gym 10 years ago. Yeah. So tremendous come up. Her partner, her husband, Alex Hormozy, mm -hmm also works for the portfolio more in a marketing content creator facing way. She's the CEO. Yeah. And when you look at the reception of how people receive Layla versus Alex, Alex's following is bigger. And when he posts and talks about the money he makes and the success, it's very much around, this is incredible and I want to be more like this, which I respect and similarly feel that too. Mm -hmm. But when you look at when Layla posts, people write comments like, I guess the secret is marrying Alex. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. And I, and I know like I've even heard of some businesses, maybe even with like a female CEO hiring like a male partner to like a face. show face as their like as the lead of their business just because of that perception. Um, but it is really interesting. And I don't necessarily know why exactly that is, but I do see it happening, you know? It's fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> but the cool thing is you've seized your own leverage to bring to the negotiation table. It's almost like yeah. because you've built up such a following and success on YouTube, you can now be like, you can't ignore me. <laughs> like if you want to do business with me, like this matcha brand can be really successful yeah. because of what I've done. Mm-hmm. And it gives you this credibility to almost force people yeah. to be like, you need to take me really seriously. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it's pretty cool to have something more like tangible like that yeah. to show for. Um, but it is really interesting because I have a lot of girlfriends that are similar to me, YouTube creators, and you would never know they have investment properties they have investment yeah. portfolios things like that they they never ever they just talk don't about. talk about it mm -hmm. when you think about your story as it's changed yeah from quiet student who is really good at drawing to <laughs> focused a test scoring student getting yeah. good grades doing sports getting into good college yeah like working on medicine to oh my gosh i'm a youtuber now and like i'm going skydiving yeah and now you're beginning like this new chapter in your life yeah around like managing people like say we come back in like five years like what do you think that what do you want that story of who you as a person to have changed or be i would hope that by that time i'm more confident of a leader i've learned how to lead people better yeah um but I still hope that my sense of like goofiness is still there I feel like even though maybe I've changed from being like shy or studious throughout the years I think at the core of it I've always been like goofy and lighthearted and just trying to have fun and I hope that that's still with me at that point I think it will uh, be but so through it all the yeah. core of goofball creativity that's me yeah <laughs> I mean it's literally yeah. how we started the pod yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Hey, I'm like, hey. like let's go see I f***ed it up it's fine <laughs> it's all right <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I did notice that I'm like don't look at that it's I okay. went for the dab and you put your hand down I'm like, I'm like oh but, handshake? But, but no but see that's the power like you said yeah it's not about avoiding cringe it's about embracing it where yeah. you're like I'm still gonna go for it yeah, I'm going to if I'm going to be cringe, I'm going to be cringe with pride. That's me. I love that. Cringe with pride. Cringe with pride. Your mom, <laughs> Ashley. Thank you so much for making time of today. Course. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. Awesome. That was it. That's a wrap. Cool. How are you feeling? I ended with cringe with pride. That's me. Cringe with pride. <laughs> That's the tagline. That's funny. Good. Thank you. That was a really good conversation. Oh, you killed it. Awesome.